is I know that you, um, like you said, 98%, you're going to just be kind of teaching, you know, as you do. Mm-hmm. Would you do this in a way we, now we have a global audience. Um, can you, can you speak as if you were doing a diagnosis of Americans? <laughs> can you do that for us today? Cause that's really the direction that I, I, I want to go because we have a large listening audience. I feel like we're in a bubble and I feel like we cannot see ourselves. We cannot objectively see ourselves right now as it relates right. to narcissism and you're outside of us. You're an expert. Can you help us? Well, I'm not sure it'll be of help. Sometimes introspection and self-awareness are counterproductive, but I will do my best to provide. It. It's just profound what you have taught. And I, I, I know, you know, thank you. Yeah, I know. I, I know you understand this, but literally uh, to to be able to sit and talk to a person who's been influential in the work that you do. Again, I, I just want to I- extend my thanks. Don't worry about it. My, my pleasure to be with you. And I'm, I'm grateful to you for having me. Okay. Um, it's important to discuss these subjects. And I think you're doing a service to the community and to, and to people at large all over the world. For so sure. We owe each other gratitude. I'd like to welcome the Mental Speak family to the, to the broadcast today. I'm your host, LaTanya Davison, licensed master social worker, uh, mental health therapist, and social psychologist. And I have on, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have on this gentleman. It's been um, many years for myself that I've been researching the topic of narcissism. I know that right now, particularly for Americans. Now we have a global audience, but Americans are in a very unique situation where we are what I believe locked in, in a bubble, uh, that is, uh, not allowing us for, uh, perspective, uh, political aspects, social aspects. I think it requires us to, uh, bring in those who can help us start to make sense to to gain awareness to gain a greater consciousness about who we are what we become what we are in the present and I, I really don't think we're able to see it objectively this gentleman is an expert on the topic actually many topics but specifically the topic of narcissism and he is going to educate us today he's going to enlighten us today um, And hopefully we can be courageous enough to uh, listen. I don't think we're listening these days. I think we need to take the time to listen, to learn, and hopefully to apply the knowledge that's given to us today. So I would like to welcome to the show, Mr. Sam Vagnon. And I want you to tell us about yourself, your background. He says he's going to do 98% of the talking, and I'm just going to sit back and let him indulge us. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You made me, you made me sound like an Indian guru, which, <laughs> which, which I'm not. I, uh, my name is Sam Batman. I'm a professor of psychology in several universities. I've written a series of books about personality, of which is Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, in its 10th edition. I've written it in 1995. I started to write it in 1995, when there was utterly no awareness of narcissism especially of the pathological kind. Narcissism had been bandied around by cultural critics such as Christopher Lash, by um, psychoanalysts um, such as Kohut or Kernberg and so on, but it's been limited to um, a very tiny uh, circle of arcane scholars and, and no one simply knew about it. Lehman definitely didn't. 1995, I released uh, the genie. I let the genie out of the bottle and I had to create a whole new language to communicate to people who are not adepts <laughs> in psychology. This question is being debated to this very day and I think it behooves us and would be also helpful to make a distinction between pathological narcissism as a clinical diagnostic entity, the equivalent of tuberculosis or cancer of the mind. Um, on the one hand, and in, in its most extreme form, known as narcissistic personality disorder, and narcissism 
as a societal, cultural, and historical organizing principle, an explanatory uh, principle that allows us to understand the world around us. So Nazism has these two facets, and they are very often conflated and confused. I, I started, my early work was with a clinical entity. I studied narcissistic personality disorder in individuals and in their interpersonal community, etc., etc. Then I branched out into narcissism in politics, and then from there into narcissism in, in society as, medi as mediated today via technology. Um, this is a kind of general background of myself and my work. It, like you said, I feel like you were one of the pioneers of actually discussing the topic online. When I was initially researching uh, the topic, again, I want to say maybe 2012, 2013, there weren't a lot of uh, a lot of people discussing uh, this topic at all. I, it was pretty much your face was synonymous with with this topic. Uh, do you feel like you're a pioneer of of bringing narcissism to the forefront? I was the only person to discuss narcissism online between 1997 and 2004. That's a fact. I yeah. had the only website yeah. dedicated to narcissism. I had the only support group dedicated to victims of narcissistic abuse, and I coined 99% of the language everyone is using today. I coined phrases such as narcissistic abuse. I coined the phrase uh, somatic narcissist, cerebral narcissist, no contact, I mean, you name it. 99% of the language is mine, ghosting, uh, hoovering. I mean, it's all, I had to. There was no language. And in the absence of language, there's no insight. And in the absence of insight, there's no change and no, no ability to transform and to develop, and to develop and to evolve and to avoid dangers. So I had to, first of all, invent the language. And then following the language, I had to, to sort of disseminate it somehow. The Internet was very helpful, frankly. The Internet at that time was, there's very little to do with the Internet of, shall we say, uh, up to 2006 or 2007. These were two... Uh, totally dissimilar technological phenomena. The internet until 2007 was community oriented, a bit altruist, a lot altruistic actually, uh, had to do more with the dissemination of uh, knowledge, support, um, with providing access, with elevating people intellectually, emotionally and otherwise, etc., etc. The internet after 2006-07 became much more narcissistic and um, was, was me-focused, became me-focused. And um, later on, I think this phase, which is the third phase of ev evolution, the Internet is becoming psychopathic. So the Internet reflects major social trends. I, I for one, don't, I don't believe that technology engenders social trends. I think it's the culmination and reification of processes that take place in communities and in, in other organizational social units, such as families, uh, nations, uh, politics, etc., etc. And I think what happened is, as people became more and more narcissistic, a fact that is documented in quite a few studies, most notably the studies of Twenge and Campbell and others, as people became more and more narcissistic, they demanded empowerment they insisted on access. They wanted interaction with like-minded people in order to amplify and enhance the, their omnipotence and omniscience and alleged or self-imputed omnipotence and omniscience and so on. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of grassroots peer pressure. There's demand, there's supply. And the internet had been utterly transformed within fewer than three years. I watched the and I really appreciate the fly on the wall series. I hope I hope you guys continue that you and your wife, um, yes, we will. Lydia. It was, it, it, it was wonderful to be able to just kind of observe and engage. But she made the point that you know she herself was observing how volatile it had become towards her um, and towards yourself. Uh, and you spoke about the fact that human beings are now becoming more machine-like, more of that uh, left brain kind of logical, but to the point of, of almost being an android themselves, uh, as far as the internet is concerned, is that what you're saying? We're becoming more narcissistic 
as a result of our dependency on on technology? No, I'm saying exactly the opposite thing. I'm saying the technology had been created by these Android people to gratify their needs and to amplify their alleged and self-imputed capacity. Ah, okay. I think what happened is, I think what happened is, um, as the number of people in the world increased, as the population exploded, when I was born, which is, which is when the dinosaurs, last dinosaurs roamed the earth, when I was born, there were 3 billion people. <laughs> And today, there's 7.6 billion. It's much more difficult to be noticed. People need to feel that they are special, that they're unique. People want, want to be seen, they want to be noted. That they are being seen, that they are being observed, that they are being noticed. People, and, and in the past, 100 years ago, this pro was provided by the village. This was provided by the small town. Right. This was provided by family members, extended family, nuclear family. See, all these social units disintegrated, utterly disintegrated. Families are a long gun. Communities are nowhere to be seen. Um, towns have, have mushroomed and sprawled and became megalopolises. I mean, it's very difficult today to be, to be embedded in any kind of social fabric and to receive from this social fabric the affirmation, validation um, that one needs. So what happened is a process called atomization, starting with, with early formative years of childhood. The child needs to be seen because to be, uh, so his survival depends on being seen. If he's not noticed, attended to by his parents and caregivers, a child can die. So being seen is crucial. But it's very difficult to be seen when there's 7.6 billion others competing for scarce, uh, scarce resources and scarce attention. So narcissism has been on the rise because people want to render themselves unique, special, noticeable. Um, apart from the madding crowd. And one way to do that is via social media and, and empowering technologies. And so I think technologies reflect this need, not the other way. Technologies were created to cater to this rising tide of narcissism. And um, people have become machine-like. When you say people have become machine-like, it's interesting. In as early as 1970, there was a Japanese roboticist. His name was Mori. And he came up with the concept of the uncanny valley. He said that the more robots resemble human beings, the more ill at ease we feel in their presence. Wow. The more uncomfortable we feel, I mean, the more the machine re resembles, the closer the machine is to a human being, the more uncomfortable we feel. And this he called it the uncanny valley, uh, taking off on Freud. Freud coined the term uncanny. So. I think it's the same with the uh, with, uh, narcissists. Mm -hmm. We feel ill at ease, we feel uncomfortable, because narcissists are good imitations of human beings. However, they are not quite fully human beings. And the reason they are not fully human, human is because, of course, classic empathy. I suggested a few years ago that narcissists actually do have empathy, called empathy. But called empathy is machine-like. It's, it's cognitive, it's analytic, it, there's no emotional component in it. And so narcissists lack empathy. They don't understand the minds of other people. They don't have a theory of mind. They don't know what it is to be human. Because they lack empathy, it is, it is through empathy that we understand what it is to be human. They have, they, narcissists lack the common experience of being human. They lack, lack the archetype of all archetypes humanity. And instead what they do, they create artificial mechanical ways of coping with this lack. Sam, how do I reconcile when you say that, and this is the, the, the struggle for myself, whether it be per personally or professionally, that a lot of the, uh, the criteria for NPD, it, it sounds like people today, though, it sounds like empathy is gone. It sounds like, or, or empathy has to be learned as well. It, it, does that make sense? Like it's, it, I just, I hear a lot of what seems to be the norm now, 
but not under the diagnosis of, of narcissistic personality disorder? How do I reconcile that? Well, first of all, the diagnosis, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 5, which was published in 2013, mm -hmm. um, suggested an alternative model uh, of, of diagnosing narcissistic personality disorder, and that alternative model placed emphasis on inability to attain intimacy, a pronounced lack of empathy, mood fluctuations or mood lability, um, and a regulation of a sense of self-worth from the outside. So that goal orientation is directed by the outside. In other words, the narcissist chooses what to do and what not to do in accordance with feedback from the outside that supports his grandiose self-image and self-perception he would embark on a course of action. If the course of action is unlikely to yield this feedback, he would abstain from it. And this is the general description of diagnostic DSM-5. The DSM-4 is categorical in the sense that it provides nine diagnostic criteria, pathological envy, sense of entitlement, lack of empathy, exploitativeness, etc., etc. And if five of these nine criteria are satisfied, then you have yourself a narcissist. The problem with the previous model, the nine criteria model, is that it, were, it was possible for two people to be diagnosed as, as narcissists and to share only one diagnostic criteria, criterion, because you needed five out of nine. So one person could have one, one to five, and the other one could have five to nine. Mm -hmm. So they would share only, only the fifth criterion. Um, made I mean, forced the Committee of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 to revamp the, the whole perception of, of narcissism. The minute they did this, the minute, the minute they revamped the way they, they viewed narcissism, it became a lot more general phenomenon. As long as, as the mental health profession limited itself to nine highly specific mm, criteria, I see much fewer people uh, could have been considered narcissists. But the minute you start to talk in generalities, the minute you move from categorical, a categorical way of looking at narcissism to a dimensional way, the minute you start to say, well, people who cannot have intimacy, people who don't have empathy, it applies to a much larger chunk of the population by definition. And indeed today, um, I think, I, I don't have numbers, but I think most people that I know have narcissistic traits and narcissistic behaviors yes. and narcissistic defenses and so on. I think narcissism is an all-pervasive phenomenon today, actually to such an extent that I believe it is the organizing principle of our society, civilization, and culture. In other words, what I'm trying to say, I think we have created a civilization that is narcissistic and because it's narcissistic and increasingly more psychopathic, it pays to be a narcissist. It's a positive adaptation. It's rewarding. Yeah. If you are a narcissist, you end up being president of the United States. Wow. If you are not a narcissist, you end up being homeless. Wow. Survival. It's become a survival mechanism. It's a positive adaptation. That's the precise term. It's a wow. positive adaptation in the sense that if you adopt this set of traits, behaviors, and behaviors, you're positively reinforced, you're positively rewarded, and you can accomplish things. In, in other words, you have an impact on your environment that is beneficial to you, that is in accordance with your goals, and, and so on. So, narcissism works, to cut a long story short. In a narcissistic, psychopathic civilization, narcissism works. Yeah. And, and anything that is anti-narcissistic anti does not work. Empathy doesn't work. Community doesn't work. Teamwork doesn't work. It's now Donald a weakness. Trump, Donald Trump works. Yeah, yeah. It's now considered a weakness to be empathetic. Yeah. yeah. So here's the question. When you as a therapist, because therapy is not devoid of values. De 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 therapy is, is culture-bound. It's values oriented. Right. When you try to to heal people, to cure them, you try to heal them and to cure them in according in accordance with some ideal type. 
uh, Freud called it ego ideal. You, you try to conform them to some mold or some set of, cr of criteria or some imaginary ideal person which does not, who does not exist, of course, mm -hmm. or what we call normalcy. You try to make them more normal, statistically speaking. But if the very values change, then the whole profession of therapy should change. Because what have you? If empathy is not working anymore, if it's counterproductive, it is, if it is obstructive, if it prevents the patient from obtaining her goals, from realizing her life and life's ambitions and so on, we ask only two questions in psychotherapy, essentially. The first question is, is the patient happy? Mm -hmm. Is the patient content? Mm -hmm. Is the patient egosyntonic? That's the first question. And the second question we ask, is the patient functional? Yeah. Is there any area or set of areas in the patient's life which are adversely affected by the patient's mental constitution? If the answer to these two questions, um, if the answer is the patient is happy and she is fully functional, then her set of values is irrelevant. In other words, how do you take Donald Trump, how do you convince Donald Trump that he needs help? <laughs> Donald Trump is a psychopathic narcissist. Yeah extreme case, malignant. I, I uh, vain, vain gloriously consider myself an expert on the, on, the, on to the understanding of this condition, more than most people alive. Yes. And so I feel sufficiently qualified to make this statement. Donald Trump is a seriously sick person, utterly, malignantly narcissistic, bordering on psychopath, probably also psychopath. But how do you convince Donald Trump to attend therapy. Why would he attend therapy? His, his um, mental state was beneficial to him. He made money. He dated gorgeous women. He ended up pres being president of the United States. He, I mean, it worked for him. His psychopathic narcissism was a positive adaptation. It brought him success, luck, money, and everything else that he set as his life's goals. He is functional. He is functional yeah. in the sense that he realizes his life's ambitions. So he is functional. And if you ask him, he will tell you, of course, I'm happy. I mean, he's ego he is ego symptomic. He doesn't feel bad. He doesn't feel uncomfortable. He doesn't feel ill at ease. He doesn't feel he has to change anything. Why, why on earth would someone like Donald Trump attend therapy? What does he have to learn from a loser like, a th like the therapist. In his world, therapists are losers. So, and the problem is that more and more, more and more, our world is geared towards Donald Trumps. There is a Donald Trump in the Philippines. His name is Duterte. There's a Donald Trump in Brazil. His name is Bolsonaro. There's a Donald Trump in Russia. His name is Putin. And wow. one in Turkey, his name is Erdogan. And one in Hungary. His name is Oban, and one in Britain, his name is Lafarge. Donald Trumps are proliferating precisely because the structure of our civilization, our societies, our cultures, our political institutions, and where the money flows, the transmission mechanisms of power and money, the nexus, all this is geared to promote, to empower, to enhance, and to leverage and levitate people like Donald Trump. Why on earth would they want to change? Our values are wrong. They are outdated. They are old-fashioned. They no longer work. And in this sense, we are doing a disservice to our patients when we try to dissuade them from being narcissists. Mm. Actually, actually, in July 2017, the science magazine, New Scientist, one of the two most important in the world, the other one being Scientific American, so, new scientists came up with a cover story. Teach your children to be more narcissistic. You have a whole group of academics, Kevin Dutton, Macobi, others. You have a whole group of academics, scholars, pretty influential, pretty famous, pretty, who insist that narcissism and psychopathy are good things, that they are positive adaptations in a series of professions, that we should elevate narcissists and psychopaths to positions of power in politics, in business, and so on. That narcissists and psychopaths are creative. They are the yeast 
in our collective bread. They are the ones who come up with new art, new culture, new books, new movies, new inventions, new science, new everything. These people, these academics, they call, they invented, the, they coined the phrase high-functioning narcissists. Narcissists don't have empathy. Yes, they abuse and exploit everyone in their ambit, including their so-called nearest and dearest. Yes, they are treacherous, they are treasonous, they are exploitative, they are liars, they are antisocial, sometimes criminalized, and they are grandiose, they are delusional, they have fantasies. All this is true. All this is absolutely true. They create cults and shared psychosis into which they coerce everyone around them. They are unpleasant to be around. They are difficult as patients, as people, as collaborators in teams, in side teams. They are self-destructive and other destructive. It's all very true. But they're happy. And they succeed. And you never argue with success. You're describing any comment section on Facebook. That's the problem we're faced today. <laughs> All I hear, every bullet point that you offer, I literally observe in, in, a, in any given topic, any given circle, any given dimension right now. That is a Facebook comment section. And, and it's mm -hmm. <laughs> the, and the scary part is there will be no introspection there. There's no as you said, there's no ability. Why would we change? And it's interesting that you say that as far as as therapy goes, what I have and, and I consider it the most ethical thing I can do with with the patients that I work with is as you said, I say, are you happy? Are you functioning? And really, all I could say is, how do we minimize the effects that you have on your family, on those around you, even on yourself? Uh, because that's all I have. You know, they, they are going to uh, pursue life as they see fit. And for me, ethically, my job is to help them to do such, um, whatever it takes for them to get resources. But at this point, treatment goals have just become, how do we help you to not hurt other people? You know, it, it, that's, that's where I am in, in yeah. my work. Our, our goals, our goals as, as mental health practitioners are becoming more and more and more limited. Yes. We are beginning to lead a constricted life in the sense that we tinker. We can no longer change anything of essence, of substance, of quiddity, but we can only tinker. We can modify some behaviors which are abrasive, socially unacceptable, and damaging. We can play a little with protocols, communication protocols. We can't do much more right now. We can't do much more because what used to be considered pathological had been rendered a positive adaptation, right. had been rendered useful and helpful to the patient's life. It reminds me of Nazi Germany. In Nazi Germany, if you were not a psychopath, something was wrong with you. Mm -hmm. The positive adaptation in Nazi Germany was to have been a psychopath. Because people with psychopathy, people with antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy, in Robert Hare's uh, sense, these people rose to the top. They became the political leadership. They ran the SS. They ran the concentration camps and became fab fabulously rich. They ran the German industry. I mean, only psychopaths were able to thrive in Germany. Yes. And Germany ruled the world for a while. So what, what would have been your advice to a German patient? The German patient, listen, to be a psychopath is a bad thing. You should love the Jews. You should not hate the Jews. You should not torture people. You should not kill people. You should not. That would have been an advice that conforms to the Judeo-Christian set of values. Right. But it would have been an extremely bad advice. Yes. Because that patient would have immediately become an outcast and would, it would have even endangered his life. So, depends, um, psychology uh, is, cut, is context dependent. And the context right now is narcissism. Long, long time ago, in 1995, I wrote an article 
one of the first I've ever written about the topic, where I have warned that narcissism is the equivalent of a viral epidemic. And if not stopped, it will infect and affect everything. You mentioned the comment section in Facebook, online forums, Instagram, mm -hmm. other social media, the workplace, parishes, church parishes. I mean, all these places are infested and infiltrated with narcissists. And the minute there's one or two or three of them, the whole place is, is transformed and becomes narcissistic because we all have healthy narcissism. Narcissism is the foundation of our sense of self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence. Without healthy narcissism, we're in very bad shape. So we all have healthy narcissism. And what pathological narcissists succeed to do, they succeed to activate, activate, elicit this healthy narcissism, bring it to the surface. There was a guy, there were two uh, French philosophers in the 1960s, Louis Althusser and Guy Debord. Guy Debord came, uh, wrote a book called The Society of the Spectacle. And Guy Debord said, we are entering a period where appearances will become much more important than reality, the image. Wow. That's why I call it society of the spectacle. He said images will become much more important than yes. reality. Yes. And Althusser, Louis Althusser, who ended up, by the way, in the mental asylum, Louis Althusser warned us that it, these images uh, create a process called interpolation. They force us to act unbeknownst to us. So he said that images have a huge power. And this is what narcissists do. Because the narcissist constructs, at a very early age, the narcissist constructs a false self. That is a concept that I borrowed from Winnicott. He constructs a false self. The, this self is false. It is godlike. It's not realistic. It's an image. It's a confabulation. It's a piece of fiction. And so the narcissist is concerned with maintaining this piece of fiction. In other words, the narcissist is constantly producing a movie. He's a movie producer and a movie director. And he's concerned with the movie, not with reality. And so when you're interacting with the narcissist, you're interacting with the image that he projects, with his reflection, with this piece of falsity, prevarication and confabulation called the false self. And so as Louis Althusser taught us, these images have a lot of power. They induce action. And so it's enough to have two or three narcissists in a group of 100 for all 100 people to become narcissistic. And in this sense, many of the observations of this new group of academics, when they say that narcissists are like yeast, they are right. Narcissists are exactly like yeast. They are catalysts. They catalyze an enzymatic reaction that transforms everyone around them into narcissists. And then, of course, it's like the zombie apocalypse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These yeah. hundred narcissists, yeah. they transform 10,000 people. Yes. And these 10,000 transform a million. And then a whole nation becomes narcissistic, as you are, as you are experiencing right now. Yes. And the question that I, I think, you know, for the listeners and, you know, for myself, how do we, again, if it's become us, how do we know, you know, how do we, and if we're asking, I've, I've read that if we ask the question, am I a narcissist? It could be one of two answers. It can be the fact that you're asking the question means that you're not, or that if you can answer the question, yes, that you are, you, you know, are we, are we, <laughs> are we all narcissistic um, at this point? No, it's a, it's an, it's an unfortunate online myth that narcissists are not self-aware. It's utterly wrong. Actually, the majority of narcissists are completely self-aware. But they are proud of their narcissism. They are self-aware. They are aware of it. But they are proud of it. If you talk to narcissists, as I've been doing for 23 years, I have the biggest, probably the largest database of yes. interviews with narcissists, uh, people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. The minute I, the minute I find one, I send them questionnaires, and because they are narcissists, they answer them, thousands of people. So narcissists, first of all, the majority of them knew because they had been diagnosed and also knew before, before they had been diagnosed, that they were narcissistic. But as, as opposed to non-narcissistic people, they were proud of it. They considered narcissism 
the next stage, the next phase in human evolution. Uh -huh. They consider themselves superior. They consider themselves the harbingers and the pioneers of a new type of human, um, transhumanity, kind of transhuman variant. They uh, um, regarded themselves as endowed with such gifts to humanity in some ironic way, ironic way, they, they converted the, their narcissism into an act of altruism. They said, yes, we may be, but we are doing this to advance humanity's cause. We are the unfortunate pioneers. We are, we are actually self-sacrificial. We, we should be admired. We are saints because we are so superior and yet, and yet we deploy our considerable assets which render, render us superhuman, we deploy it to help our less fortunate, um, the less fortunate members of society who are not narcissists. So there's a whole ideology that had developed around narcissism, an ideology which glorifies narcissism, renders it an asset, something to aspire to, a role model for imitation and emulation. When you analyze uh, speeches by the likes of Donald Trump, and not only Donald Trump, Tony Robbins and, you know, numerous others who are, uh, I mean, <laughs> different their narcissism. They don't shy away from it. They just divide the world to winners and losers. Me and others. I mean, superior and inferior. They don't shy away from their narcissism. They glorify it. They, they render it religious. And here I want to say something that most people don't, I think, <clears throat> let's put it this way, didn't, didn't, they didn't consider narcissism the way I'm going to present it right now. Narcissism, pathological narcissism, is in, most, in the vast majority of cases a reaction to childhood abuse. Right. The abuse can be classic, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal, psychological abuse, but abuse can also mean uh, putting the child on a pedestal idolizing the child, considering the child an extension of the parent, um, rewarding the child when the child succeeds, so performance, using the child to realize the parent's unfulfilled wishes and fantasies and hopes, etc., etc. Whenever we don't allow the child to separate from the parent and to individuate, we have a situation that is abusive. So some children, small minority, react with pathological narcissism. They develop pathological narcissism. And what do they do, these children? These children create an entity, a separate entity called the false self. The false self is everything that the child is not. The child is helpless. The false self is omnipotent. The child cannot predict the behavior of his parents because they are narcissistic. The false self is omniscient. The child uh, is... Uh, told by the parents that it is bad and unworthy and, and uh, deficient. The false self is perfect and brilliant. So the false self is everything the child is not. We will easily, we easily see that the false self is actually God. It's God. Yes. <laughs> the child had created God. And narcissism becomes a private religion. As the narcissist grows, he worships the false self and he makes a human sacrifice to the false self. Wow. like they used to do with the Moloch in yeah. the Bible. And this human sacrifice is himself. The narcissist sacrifices himself, his true self, to the Moloch of the false self. The narcissist offers himself. The narcissist says, listen, I will annul myself. I will cancel out myself. I will annihilate myself. I will disappear. Just be with me. For you. Just, yeah. I mean, yeah. here I am. I will disappear as a true self and I will reappear in your form. And and as you spoke so poignantly and it and it, it validated my own thoughts, the the internet is waiting there for you to create an avatar for you to project <laughs> that self onto. Now you have a hologram to embody all that is your God and and, and then you present that that being to everyone and, and, and say, look, look at, look at this wonderful self, this creation that I've created mm -hmm. and, and, and on and on and on. 
It's it's insane. And it's a yeah. It's a religious experience. Yes. The 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 worshiper merges with God and becomes God by disappearing. Wow. And that's narcissism. That's the best description of narcissism that I can come up with. It, it's profound. And so when the narcissist grows up, when the narcissist grows up, he and of himself, because there's no real self there, the true self had been sacrificed. So he speaks of his false self and of his disorder in religious terms. Most narcissists will tell you that they are on a mission. Most narcissists will tell you that their life has cosmic significance. Most narcissists will tell you, ever since I was small, I knew I'm destined to big things. Most narcissists will, will discuss themselves as divinities, as godlike creatures, at the very least, idols. Even if they are nobodies, zero true losers in life, they would still convert their, their situation into some step on the way to, to grandeur and grandiosity. So, when you talk to someone like, or when you listen to someone like Donald Trump or similar narcissists, Donald Trump, for example, keeps presenting himself as a sacrificial lamb. You know, he's mm -hmm. sacrificing. He's, everything he's doing is a sacrifice, actually. He, did, he, he openly says, I didn't need to be president of the United States. I'm doing it for you. You know, it's like Jesus. Yes. He sounds like a mutation of Jesus. Hitler used exactly the same eschatology and religious speech. Hitler presented himself as the embodiment of the historical spirit of Germany and sacrificed himself. For example, he never got married. When people asked him, why, don't you, why didn't you ever get married? Hitler used to answer, because I'm married to Germany. And that is, of course, immediately reminiscent of the Catholic Church, where nuns and monks are married to Jesus. That's why they don't have sex. That's why they don't get married. In this sense, pathological narcissism is a new global religion, a new, a new global cult. That is its, the source of its power. This is why it is becoming so all-pervasive, prevalent, um, admired, and propagated, and so on. Because it embodies and is imbued with religious motives and archetypes. Jesus, sacrifice, God, mm -hmm. omnipotence, omniscience. I mean, it's, there are echoes, echoes that go back thousands of years. It's, it taps, narcissism taps into the, what Jung used to call collective unconscious. Yes. It's a, it's a much more profound phenomena than an asshole who is not empathic. Right. You know? <laughs> and I the, mean, people, the, yeah, this people, is the Fourth Reich. I mean, it, I, that's what I hear. I hear... Reduce narcissism at an inflection point, absolutely at an inflection point. And there is the possibility of the emergence of a new religion. Not in the classic sense, with a supreme being, but a new decentralized religion, a new network religion, where everyone is God. God, distributed God. A kind of distributed God. Where everyone is God. Yeah. And, and together, they are the God. It reminds me of a story I read, science fiction story. I read a long time ago. Uh, the story is about a scientist who connects all the computers in the world to each other. And when he finishes connecting all the computers in the world to each other, he asks this vast network of computers, he asks, who are you? Well, of course, I'm God. It's the same with narcissism. Each one of the nar each narcissist is a God. And when they're all put together, it is the God, yes. the one and only. Yes. It's in this sense a religion. We don't understand it, how dangerous this is. It, it becomes the, the thought form, what they call the, the, the egregore, where, where it's just one hive mind of, uh, <laughs> as you so, said, godlike beings. Um, what's the prognosis, Sam? What's, what's the prognosis? How does this... Are, are we, you know, do we, do we hit the pinnacle and then, you know, it's, it's downhill from there? How, how does this play out? I don't know if it's downhill or up, uphill. Obviously, you, using phrases such as, the, uh, words such as downhill and uphill implies value judgment. Uh, we hive mind. Um, a video I made two or three years ago is exactly about this, that narcissism is a hive mind. 
we are going to be transformed. I think we are moving from more individualistic modes of relating to the world and to each other to more collective modes of relating to each other and to ourselves with a distribution, um, distribution of power so that each one of us is God unto himself. So we have reduced God into the network and we had become gods consequently. Now, the question is, how well are we built to cope with our new role as God? Because throughout human history, from probably from, from prehistory, I'm agnostic, don't misunderstand, I'm not espousing any religion. I personally have a very dim view of organized religion and an even dimmer view of, of God as a construct, yes. supreme being and yes, so on. Yes. So, I'm not a religious person, it's important to, to, to say. But what I'm saying is, from, from, the, from ancient prehistory, we had a very clear relationship between, uh, between God and man. God had his, his, his roles, men had his roles, and they all collaborated more or less efficiently and, and well. I think it's the first time in human history where we are humanizing, I mean, we tried it once with Jesus. We humanized God with Jesus. It didn't work too well. So I think it's the second time we're trying to humanize God by reducing God to us. Uh, the first attempt was, had its problems. What we are doing now, we are decentralizing God. We are converting God into the network metaphor. And it is the first time that we are subsuming God and digesting God and becoming God. Are we built for that? Do we have the tools, mental, psychological, organizational, societal, cultural, to cope with such a massive, unbelievable, incredible, unprecedented transformation? I don't know. Narcissism is a reaction to that, obviously, because if I am godlike suddenly, it can get to my head, you know, go to my head. Mm -hmm. Did um, um, a few decades ago, two decades ago, a professor by the name of Milman in Harvard University came up with the idea or diagnosis or whatever you want to call it of acquired situational narcissism. He said that it's true that most is formed or is fostered in early childhood, but there can be late onset narcissism. Narcissism that is the outcome of changing life circumstances. He studied rock stars. Rock stars were totally normal people before they became rock stars. And then they became rock stars and they scored very high on, narcissis on tests for narcissism, like narcissistic personality disorder and MMPI too. So he said that they became narcissists late in life because their circumstances of their life changed. And he called it acquired situational narcissism. I think most of the narcissism that we see today in adults is acquired situation of narcissism, not the pathological kind, the, not the clinical entity that we're used to. Most of these people were never abused as children. Most of them are normal folks. Ten years ago, they were okay. They were empathic, they were nice, they, were, uh, they worked in teams, they were collaborative, they were, they were happy, nice people, you know. Suddenly, ten years later, they have no empathy, they have no intimacy, they are rapacious, they are predatory. What on earth happened to these people in these 10 years? They are 50 years old, they're 40 years old, they're 30 years old. It couldn't have been their childhood. So this is late onset narcissism. This is acquired situation of narcissism. Okay, what has changed in the situation? What made them narcissists? They didn't become rock stars. The vast majority of them didn't become rock stars. What happened? What happened is technology. They were empowered by technology. Mm -hmm. the, every person today, everyone can, everyone and his dog can publish a book, make a television, <laughs> right. made even normal people godlike. The power that a typical internet user has today at her fingertips, the, what happened is technology. Technology rendered each and every one of us godlike. The things you can do today with your, with your iPhone, multinational companies couldn't do in the 1960s. The total computing power in iPhone 6 
which is, you know, <laughs> an ancient rendition of iPhone. <laughs> it's a dinosaur. The total, total computing power in iPhone 6 far exceeds the computing power that NASA had when it sent a man to the moon. And, and you can publish books, you can make radio shows, you can have TV emissions, I mean, you can do anything. You can do anything. You are omnipotent by virtue of technology. And you are omniscient if you have access to Wikipedia. So we have become gods. I think this transformation in our situation, situation this induced in us acquired situational narcissism late onset narcissism and so we need to distinguish the classic construct of narcissism which is a clinical diagnostic entity from late onset narcissism which is much more common much more common it's a little like diabetes 1 and diabetes 2 yes the diabetes 1 is you know genetic in, in uh, inherited etc etc in childhood it's a childhood disease diabetes 2 is acquired much later in life owing to bad lifestyle, wrong lifestyle decisions like no exercise, uh, overeating, and so on. So we are having narcissism one and narcissism two. Narcissism one is child, a childhood disease. Narcissism is circumstantial and the outcome of lifestyle choices and access to technology. I want to ask you uh this is something that's been on my mind because of the, you know, the the prognosis that we've been told, as you said, that there's there's no reason to change um, when it works. But I do want to present to you. You've been doing this for quite a while, uh, twenty three years, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. How has it transformed you? Has it has it had any effect on on minimizing your traits? And can that apply I, to us? I have been, di I've been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice in the space of uh, 10 years. And um, the first time I've been diagnosed, it was in a, included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, four or five years before. So no one knew, much, knew anything about it. <laughs> so I, I didn't pay too much attention to, to a clinical entity that that is just at its inception and right. there's no studies no research no nothing i didn't take it seriously then in 1995 i've been diagnosed again with a narcissistic personality disorder comorbid with other issues and so this time i took it seriously and that's when i started my work on the on the subject and ever since then i've been working on the subject in the last six years i have developed a treatment modality a therapy for narcissistic personality disorder and depressive uh, illnesses. Uh, there is a, a strong connection between narcissism and depression. We can talk about it if you want, but I developed a treatment modality, which I dubbed cold therapies all over the world. I just came back from Brazil and so on. Uh, and it's, it's aimed and targeted at specifically narcissistic personality disorder, nothing else. Um, the work on cold therapy and teaching cold therapy and writing about cold therapy have has transformed me. Obviously, I haven't been treated with cold therapy because um, the first therapist will be certified ne certified next year. Okay. I hadn't been treated, but the very fact of working on it and developing it and being exposed to it somehow had had a, had an effect on me. Uh, for example, I lost my need for narcissistic supply. This mm -hmm. interview, not with, notwithstanding. <laughs> right. No, really, I didn't. I don't need it anymore. I right. am utterly, utterly devoid of the compulsion to obtain narcissistic supply, which is a g enormous, um, an enormous gene and the core fuel and the core, you know, schema in narcissism, is the compulsive, uninhibited, uh, non-controllable need to obtain narcissistic supply. Right. In this sense. Narcissism is a form of addictive personality. So um, I lost that. I don't need supply at all. I can go on for months and, and longer without any supply, and I'm not bothered in the least. That's an interesting development. Uh, but with that exception, nothing, nothing much else has happened, with that exception. So it didn't have much of an impact on, on me. Um, I, w I have applied 
cold therapy to 43 volunteers in various cultures, societies, countries around the world. And five years later, three to five years later, there's follow-up, uh, all of them have uh, lost both depressive aspect. Wow. I mean, there's no trace of narcissism there, of any kind. Yeah. Um, they score very low on NPI, MMPI, et cetera, et cetera, and they, they are not narcissists. I mean, they, today they cannot be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. So it seems that, but 43 is a tiny sample. Right. Non-representative, non-representative, and so I warn against any optimism. Of course. I like yet, anecdotal. I like anecdotal, though. <laughs> works, yet it's it works for me. Yet it's taking into account the intractable nature of narcissism. The, it's like, you know, having a, a liver, liver cancer where the survival rate is zero, essentially. Right. And then curing 43 cases. And you can say, okay, 43 cases is nothing. There's 60,000 mm -hmm. uh, patients a year. It's a tiny percentage. Yeah, it's true. It's all true. But all 60,000 used to die. And these 43 hadn't. So, you know, um, a key to a possibility, a potential. I'm warning. I'm being very disclaimer-like. I, it seems I found some key, and if you're interested, I will tell you what are the underlying philo what's the underlying philosophy. Of I would love I would love to hear it. Actually, I, I don't I want to hijack yeah. your your space. No, no. Please. So, cold therapy is founded on the on the belief that we had mis completely misunderstood narcissism. We cast narcissism as a personality disorder, and what cold therapy says is actually narcissism has nothing to do with the personality that the narcissist's personality is both intact and healthy, but has been subjected to such trauma and such torsion early on that the narcissist is in a permanent post-traumatic condition. So, first of all, cold therapy treats narcissism, it, it casts narcissism as a form of complex PTSD. Second thing, uh, the mistake of all other treatment modalities, and I know all of them by heart because I've used, I've borrowed from all of them. So the mistake of all other treatment modalities is that they interact with the narcissist as though the narcissist were an adult. But narcissists are not adults. Mentally, narcissists are children. So narcissism is a case of arrested development. Perhaps the case, the most dominant case of arrested development. Mm -hmm. The narcissist is frozen at age six or seven or eight or nine. And that's where it stops. That's it. Interacting with a narcissist as an adult is utterly useless because you are talking to a nine-year-old. It's child psychology. And it is constructed entirely as a form of child psychology, uh, child uh, therapy. So this is the second. The third uh, observation is that uh, narcissism is a form of attachment disorder. So it deals a lot with attachment called therapy. And the fourth observation is that narcissism is an addictive, an addiction. That the narcissist has an addictive personality. And that the need for attention, adulation, admiration, affirmation, applause, input from the environment, feedback, this need is compulsive and a form of addictive, which is the outcome of conditioning and so on. Never mind. So we're talking reinforcement theory and addiction theory. So if you put the four together, arrested development, post-traumatic condition, addiction, and attachment disorder. We know how to treat all four very effectively. We have extremely effective therapies for trauma, with uh, addictions. We, I mean, we know how to treat this. We do not know how to treat narcissistic personality disorder. Right. We never right. succeed. Right. I mean, it's total failure. But we are extremely successful with these other four elements. So. If you treat narcissists as though they are poor, as though they are traumatized children with addictions, you, the success rate is much higher. And indeed, it proved itself. Yes. Cold therapy is successful. Because when I talk to the uh, patient in cold therapy, patient number 44 is starting on Saturday, by the way. When I talk to a patient in cold therapy, I don't talk to her. As an adult, I deal with her addiction and I deal with her trauma and I completely ignore her, her functioning, her social structures. All this is utterly relevant to me because she is a child 
a traumatized child who developed dysfunctional coping mechanisms such as addiction and who is incapable of attachment because of pain aversion. We know how to treat such children. We treat millions of such children exceedingly successfully. Narcissists are such children. I, I have a, uh, I, 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 and I'm, I'm telling you, forgive me for, for tripping up on my thoughts and my words because I literally am in my head as you're speaking. I've worked with uh, trauma victims. I'm also a 14-year military veteran. Um, mm. So I, I've worked with military vets, children with trauma, adults with trauma in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. And all I can see right now is exactly what you're saying, that we deal with the individual criteria of each diagnosis. And mm -hmm. we've always been told that as a whole, no, you cannot treat a narcissistic personality disordered person. You can't do it. Even, you know, they'll tell you it's difficult to treat a borderline personality disorder patient. But exactly what you're saying, no, we're dealing with all the criteria, just going down the line and mm -hmm. dealing with the criteria under each category and as a whole, treating the whole person. Absolutely True. amazing and profound. If you have yeah. been, if you've been, since you have been involved in trauma, yeah. I mean, uh, PTSD, classic PTSD probably, yeah. yes, vets, mm -hmm. vets and so on. You know well that people with trauma become much more narcissistic. Very, it's oh one my of the God, features. Yes, yes, yeah. It's one of the features of traumatized people that initially, at least, lose empathy. They become self-centered. They they become exploitative and demanding. They have a sense of entitlement. Um, they develop uh, fantasies. They withdraw from reality. They become delusional very often, etc., etc. Yeah. These are the hallmarks yes. of narcissism. Yes. Yes. Uh, they become narcissists simply. Actually, the irony is that the first observation that trauma leads to narcissism is well, well over 130 years old. There was a guy called Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was, a, I think, a construction foreman. And a, a, a steel bar penetrated his brain, damaged his brain. I mean, it was a horrible accident and uh, destroyed half his skull, half his brain, don't ask. And he was heavily traumatized. And the doctors at the time described a striking change in his personality. They said he used to be empathic, now he's not. Mm -hmm. He used to be uh, helpful, now he's a describing narcissistic personality disorder. So we knew, the, the, we knew about the connection between brain trauma and uh, physical brain trauma and narcissistic personality. But what we failed to understand or failed to make the connection is that uh, mental trauma is the exact equivalent of physical trauma, and this is mediated by neuroplasticity. The brain is plastic. You can penetrate the brain with a steel bar, or you can traumatize the brain. And in both cases, there will be lasting damage. In both cases, the brain will rewire. The artificial distinction between physical trauma mm -hmm. and non-physical trauma is exactly this, artificial, wrong. And so anyone who has ever dealt with traumatized patients knows how self-centered, egotistic. Yes. Toddler-like. <laughs> Toddler-like, yeah. whining, uh, I mean, narcissists they are. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that. Everyone who's ever dealt with traumatized patients. And so why we, didn't, we don't make the logical leap? If traumatized patients are narcissists, narcissists are traumatized patients. Absolutely profound. And, and you know why I it, it's why they call what we do practice. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 ever changing and, it, you know, it's dynamic. It's and to me, this is something that can lead in a whole other direction. It almost answers the question when I present, you know, well, what do we do now? Well, it sounds like we, you know, we have a person who's been at the forefront, continuing to do the research, continuing to explore and give us the answers and and it sounds like if someone who is uh you know where we before would tell a family member or loved ones uh listen <laughs> you've got a narcissist yeah. this is what you've got deal with it sorry don't know what to tell you get away do you still give the same advice or is that starting to change because you 
you know, there was a time where you said, look, you've just got to abandon the person. Is that also going to change as well? It was I. It was I who came up contact strategy yeah. in yes, 1997. You did. <laughs> yeah, you I, I invented did. <laughs> the whole thing. But uh, now, now I'm offering hope via cold therapy. Of course, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm alone, and uh, I can only take as, uh, these many people. And so I'm taking now patient number 44. Because uh, after, I mean, the therapy itself is short, by the way. It's uh, three to four months. But after that, I usually take a year, sometimes a year and a half, to analyze the patient notes, the case notes, and the, so as to create a coherent body. Mm -hmm. And so in between patients, I also give seminars and certification seminars and so on. I mean, the, the cold therapy is sometimes counterintuitive and definitely a bit, uh, so, uh, even if I say so, a bit revolutionary, because uh, that's not the view of Nazism. This has never been the view of Nazism. Nazism, initially in 1915, when Freud first suggested the, ter the word narcissism, was considered a regression. Like you're a baby, you have narcissism, then when you grow up and you're adult, if you go back to being a baby, you, you're sick, you know? So it was a regression, then it was this, then it was that, and uh, the most recent incarnation is that it's a personality disorder. I don't need to tell you. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is an insurance document. It's mm -hmm. a document created for insurance companies. Yes, sir. There's a lot of money. A lot of money riding on this definition. And that's why, for example, the, the Committee of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, or Categorical Model, they wanted to, to throw to the trash, as it should be, the nine diagnostic criteria of the DSM-4. But pressure from interest groups, pharmaceutical industry, um, other, I mean, uh, all the money <laughs> that's sloshing around prevented them from doing this. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they put in, the, they copied, copy-pasted the DSM-4, but then they said, actually, ignore it. We have an alternative model, which is much better. And it's a dimensional model. So there's a lot of money sloshing around. So there are vested interests, strong. I can feel them now. I didn't feel them two or three years ago. But now that cold therapy is spreading, I'm beginning to feel the pushback. Oh, you feel it. And the pushback <laughs> never comes. Pushback never comes from professionals like you. Professional, professionals like you are fascinated. They want to learn it. I mean, they are, you know, they are in a mood with, with new therapies and concepts. Solutions. We, we like solutions. We don't like capitalizing on illness. <laughs> so, right. yeah. And so pushback comes from, from ac academics or academic institutions allied with industry, from industry. From, yep. I, that's where I'm getting the pushback. So, for example, if, if a seminar was supposed to have been organized in a specific European country, I would not, which I would not name, it's just been cancelled because the pharmaceutical industry in that country allied with the, with the biggest university there, whose professors are at the pay of this mm -hmm. industry, and, you know, uh, said it's unproven experimental procedure and therefore illegal to teach it. Yes. Which is utter nonsense, of course. It's yeah. illegal to practice it, maybe, but not to teach it. <laughs> and so on. So it's been cancelled. So I'm beginning to see pushback, which is a good sign. It means that it's, you know, it means you're doing the right thing. beginning to have an impact. Yeah, 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 it means you're on the right path. I'll tell you this, that this is the reason why I stepped out to do an independent show where outside of the mainstream we can have these discussions, have these conversations, yeah. and let people put the information in the, directly into the hands of the people um, I have a uh, a colleague, uh, she is a, a clinical social worker, and she directly takes my shows to her students, and so uh, her master's level students. So it, it, cold therapy will be known, and I'm looking forward, you said it'll be cert it, it certified next year? Yeah, next September. Okay. The first certified therapist will be next September, about 40 of them. So... As far as I'm concerned, um, you know, we, we, we won't worry about uh, the, the institutional, the ivory tower uh, control no, of information. I'm not, yeah, not, a, not at all. <laughs> no, I know you're not. And, and we'll definitely support um, whatever you endeavor because, again, um, my goal this year is to actually be, to listen, first of all, to listen to those who have gone before us who are teaching us, um, teaching us the way to go. And uh, I think you're one of those people 
Thank your, you. your your work is profound again and i'm not just you know it's it it, it literally is I, I wish i had the the terminology uh to express it but i want people to actually be able to apply the knowledge to their life and whether it's you know, going to happen in, in our lifetime? I don't know if it's going to happen this generation. I don't know. But I know that narcissism does not work <laughs> for us. <laughs> it's not yeah, working for it's us. Not. Yeah. It's dangerous, simply dangerous to the survival of the species. I'm not exaggerating. This, this is not hypo hyperbole. It's simply dangerous. It's beginning to be seriously dangerous. It's, uh, let me ask you something. I yes. read the, on a Facebook page that you're a comedian. I am. I do, do, I do, do, do stand-up comedy. Yeah, you do stand-up comedy? <laughs> I do. Really? I do, here and there. I do. And it, it, let What's me a wonderful combination. Let me tell you what it does, Sam, is it allows for the, and I'm sure you know this, think of all the inappropriate aspects of your mind that you go into, but you know everyone else does the same thing. It'll, it allows mm -hmm. for me to go to that space with the work that we do and find the humor in it. Uh, because it can be so serious at times and and it also mm -hmm. you know it it breaks the mold of the status quo I can say the things that I cannot say about the industry right but I can go on the stage and I can say it completely and I can say it in a witty way uh, that also makes people yeah. laugh and makes them think at the same time so it I don't know how it worked out I'm just kind of rolling with it <laughs> it works yeah <laughs> Berk Berkson and others suggested that sense of humor is a, is a form of, uh, is a kind of unco the unconscious. And so I think stand-up comedy is um, anti-repression. Uh, it is. It brings, that, brings the unconscious up. Yeah. And, and this in, in a disinhibited way. It's very, very therapeutic. Very therapeutic. It is a great work. That's what I call it. It's definitely an in, in, in alchemy. It, it's, it's a form of alchemy as far as I'm concerned. And um, I... Great. I, you know, and I put this out to my listeners. I'm, I'm very honest. I, I look back to my teen 20s. I was as narcissistic as one could be. I'm 40 now. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that I've that I've done a lot of work and I want to extend the hope to others. I hope that this conversation uh, helps people to be to, to, to be hopeful that, that there is, I, it's funny because the, the conversation starts off. It's so bleak. And I'm like, well, what happens now, Sam, but you're giving us hope. And, uh, and <laughs> well, I'm excited about in that. My, in my own, in my own small way, I hope. Okay. Listen, um, Thank send, you me the so file, much. send me a video file. I'll upload it to my YouTube channel. I it sure will. Massive, massive viewership. And you have a great distribution to the audio files. Yes, so sir. So let's cover as much ground as we can. Let's do what we can. And uh, let us know if you, if you need anything in the future as far as a platform or distribution, anything like that. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. You have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.